So just as a sort of start, this is obviously just an illustrative uh, graph, but um, as Zandra has mentioned, and as you're going to hear frequently through that, there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to uh, amphibian nutrition. Um, we don't really know the fine grain detail, or even the sort of middle grain detail that's needed to, to properly understand uh, amphibian uh, requirements, uh, nutrition-wise, from a, an, ev an evidence-based point of view. And on top of that, we know that every species is different. Um, so what we have to try to do is work out um, where um, sort of the very basics, try to cover all of the bases, and then um, evaluate our successes and failures and try to improve. Um, the, the nutritional requirements book is there simply because that's one of the last times there were comprehensive um, sort of legally linked uh, requirements for um, laboratory animals and a lot of documents out there saying what particular species require or not. If you actually follow the referencing chain back, you'll find it goes back to documents like this. And that's the case for um, uh, documents like uh, there was a paper by Ferry et al that looked at trying to provide re uh, re recommendations for the sort of composition of amphibian diets. But this was all based on very broad assumptions of and, and combinations of, of known requirements for small mammals, for fish, um, and other things used in the laboratory and, um, and human food industries. So there are, there is information out there. It can give you a basic idea, um, and but we need to take it with a very large pinch of salt and acknowledge that it won't necessarily transfer properly to all species. There are other documents out there. I've got some just some screen grabs of, um, of, of front covers of EASA best practice husbandry guidelines for a few amphibians. Uh, there are some species specific documents out there, but again, these tend to take um, a combination of uh, evidence based sort of just based on people's experiences and anecdote, but also some sort of basic information which is known for small vertebrates as the starting point for nutritional uh, requirements. So as I said, depending where you look there, you will find some information, but pretty much never take it as a totally perfect, fine-tuned um, understanding of what a particular species or amphibians in general need. See everything as a starting point and use your own experience um, and probably share and publish your own experience so that we can try to uh, sort of put the missing pieces into the puzzle. So amphibians, um, or adult amphibians at least, are almost entirely carnivorous and ex in, or in insectivorous. This is one of the few things that links all species. There are, of course, exceptions to every rule. Um, so you've got this tree frog species, for example, that has specialised and eats uh, cactus fruits occasionally during very dry, um, dry season, but this is not really a, uh, a common occurrence. So we can say pretty much all adult amphibians eat other living creatures, normally in, in vertebrates. Larval amphibians are a totally different kettle of fish or tadpoles um, and have enormously diverse diets. They feed on everything from herb as herbivores through to omnivores and carnivores. They graze, they filter, uh, they do all kinds of weird things. And for that reason, I'm not talking about them here because it's an entirely uh, different um, talk. Uh, but it is really important to remember how diverse larval diets are and that if we want to look at examples of how species specific amphibian nutrition can be, uh, tadpoles are perhaps the best way to look. So the rest of this talk is about post metamorphic amphibians. Um, we know that um, wild amphibians feed on a huge wide variety of taxa and pretty much it's anything that fits in their mouth and isn't too toxic or distasteful or sharp or, or whatever. If they can catch it and say safely eat it, they will do. And we know from captivity that they'll often eat things that aren't safe for them to do so as well. There are some specialists, so for example, ant feeders like this uh, hemidactylus, um, but um, these are normally just morphologically specialized. So they will eat anything still that will fit in their mouths, but their feeding structures are relatively small. Um, and um, they will still eat a wide range of species within their particular niche. But in captivity, we've just got this, as, as Andrew has mentioned, only a really small range of species that's available um, in large enough numbers to sustain captive amphibian populations. It's really just five or six, a handful of species. Um, and we can culture our own um, to slightly increase that variety, but the difference is still massive and it's not something which realistically we can hope to close. Um, this is just a sort of summary of the groups. This is just the, the family and order level 
um, of uh, invertebrates and um, other prey items eaten by mountain chicken frogs. This is a really important model species for amphibian ex situ husbandry simply because it's a program that's been going so long and has such well integrated field and uh, captive um, components. The wild diet consists of more than 150 species of invertebrates and vertebrates from dozens of different uh, major groups. And in captivity, we just have this relatively small group of things. So we can see this is a brilliant example of just the, 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 the difference between what we can offer these animals in captivity and the wild. Um, and I think acknowledging that it's not possible to provide more than 150 species in captivity, plus all the different plant species and funguses and all kinds of other things that these invertebrates will be feeding and gut loading themselves on. We need to acknowledge this is always going to be a, a massive limitation and something which we're going to have to work hard to to fix um, to make captive uh, nutrition suitable for the species we're trying to look after. There's just some basic principles that I think are important to bear in mind when approaching amphibian nutrition generally. Primarily, what we're trying to do is replicate the wild as closely as possible. And we know that this applies to pretty much every aspect of amphibian husbandry. As Andrea said, that they're complex animals with these very complicated relationships with the environment. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to delimit where nutrition stops and basic husbandry starts. Um, you know, a good example is UVB uh, light provision. Is this basic husbandry environmental provision or is this nutrition because it crosses over? But if we have this idea of replicate the wild um, in, our, in our heads, it doesn't really matter where those divisions are arbitrarily placed. Um, as long as we are, are trying to do that. Researching your species is absolutely key, knowing your species. Um, if you're lucky enough, there'll be some field studies from them. Uh, there may be other previous successes, either published or in the grey literature or through talking to colleagues, or if it's not there and it's possible, going out and doing that research is really, really important. Um, and if there are field populations remaining of particular species or of closely related species, getting research on those can be absolutely invaluable. Um, and they can allow that that research can uh, either in captivity or in the field can allow us to identify important dietary components, uh, whether that's particular species that uh, these animals feed on, or whether this is particular nutrients that seem to they seem to be particularly sensitive to in a given species. Um, but identifying what you're trying to target in your diet is really important because when you know what you're aiming for, it's a lot easier to evaluate what you're doing. Um, and trying to make that captive diet as similar as possible to the wild diet. Um, if you're working with a specialist species, then um, culturing specific feeder items might be something that you need to deal with, or in a particular context. So again, going back to mountain chickens, for example, before um, the uh, before frogs could be taken back to Montserrat from captive uh, from from the captive population to found these the semi wild uh, populations that exist there now. Um, it was important to set up live food culturing facilities to support those animals and making sure that the right species were within that. Um, and if you're not going to culture things, making sure that um, you have reliable sources established for your uh, population before you start to bring in animals um, so that you know that you are going to be able to feed those animals come um, you know, rain or shine um, and not end up in a position where you end up um, scrabbling to try to feed animals because if you start to uh, get into that position um, you're really on the back foot already. If you don't know much about a species given perhaps it hasn't been researched very well in the field um, or you've had to act quickly, uh, the basic morphology of um, and of our neurons especially, um, and the, this is going to focus on our neurons simply because they are the most specialist, uh, specialised group of, um, of amphibians uh, Sicilians and uh, salamanders tend to pretty much all do the same thing. Um, so we can look at the morphology of our neurons, especially to work out something about what they might eat. You can, especially looking at the snout shape, because that dictates what can fit in the mouth and the tongue morphology. Um, so you can look at, for example, microfeeders like this Nasica patracus tend to have um, very pointed um, snouts, uh, which allows them to feed on tiny prey, it pre prevents them from feeding on larger things. Your cane toad is your, 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 your perfect example of a generalist, generalist um, and your own um, typical frog shape, relatively wide, but not enormous head um, and a sticky tongue. 
And then you've got the other end of things, macrophages like this ceratophorus uh, that often feed on vertebrates, and you can see this huge wide mouth. And you go back to this idea that the, 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 the size of the head and the, the gape size is what dictates um, the sorts of food items these animals can eat. Um, so I'm just going to look through some of the different types of prey items that are available um, for specialists. Um, so vertebrate prey items, we can get these uh, primarily um, killed and frozen through through suppliers um, for exotic animal keeping. Um, mainly these provide mammals, birds and fish. Very occasionally there can be sources of amphibians and reptiles, but the ethics and the biosecurity of land birds can be problematic. Uh, mammals and birds are usually an unnatural food item for, um, for amphibians and even for amphibians that do occasionally feed on, on mammals and birds do so fairly rarely. They're very high in fat of protein and fattened protein and have lots of fur and feathers. Um, so these are really generally a poor um, choice for feeding amphibians. If you look at some of the older literature, uh, you'll find things, um, suggestions to feed things like tiger salamanders on pinky mice, etc., which they will consume readily, um, but it's really not very good for them. They can be advantageous for occasionally for things like Ceratophorus, where um, having that skeletal content is really important for species that are uh, adapted to eating and getting the, cal the high calcium levels out of, um, out of vertebrates. Uh, fish, um, a lot of um, well, some salamander species especially are piscivorous, uh, things like cryptobranchids, pachytriton, um, and a lot of other species do feed quite a lot on amphibians um, or on just carrion. So, for example, tiffinectid silicilians um, also will often feed on carrion uh, 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 fish. Uh, but it's important to think about which fish you're using. Are these marine origin or not, for example, in terms of the salt content? And one absolutely crucial thing um, can be the thiaminase content. So especially saprinid fish are very high in thiaminase. This destroys vitamin B, uh, thiamine, um, and can lead to serious problems for species that are animals that are fed too much on this. And this um, this enzyme acts under frozen conditions. And if you mix the foods, so if you feed Cyprinid to mix with other things in the same meal or well, the same um, food items in the, the, the GI tract, this can actually break it down. So it's something to be careful of. Um, also, the fat levels can be very high. Things like salmonid fish are extremely oily. Um, so being careful of those sorts of contents is important to avoid obesity and various other digestive problems. Um, and of course, with vertebrates, there are uh, ethical issues surrounding. Um, lots of amphibians will only feed on live moving prey. Um, so we need to consider the implications of using, using live vertebrates as food. Um, if you have the time, and I'll come to it later, to uh, target feed um, amphibians using forceps and dead prey items, most species can be uh, encouraged to feed on dead prey by simulating movement or, or triggering prey uh, predatory uh, behaviours uh, in other ways. Um, it's important to make sure the vertebrates you are using are um, flash frozen and uh, or irradiated and screen for parasites because it's very easy to um, transport lots of parasites when move, for example, from fish into amphibians. So making sure that you know that your prey items are free from these things is really important. Uh, Ranavirus as, well, as well can also spread from fish to amphibians. So again, using fresh fish can be problematic. Lots of different vertebrate prey items are available, um, and these are the primary source of, of nutrition for the majority of terrestrial, especially um, amphibians, um, live prey that is. Um, so things like crickets, locusts, beetle grubs, flies, worms, um, cockroaches, and a variety of, of aquatic insect larvae and other aquatic uh, invertebrates are, are available. Um, and there are several other groups of easily cultured items, woodlice, uh, enchytrid, uh, white worms, snails, lots of different roach species. Um, and really, it's just about identifying what you need to feed your species and what can be easily cultivated under the right conditions. Um, I'm not going to go into lots of details here about culturing live food because I think that's outside the scope here. Uh, but doing the right sort of reading, there are lots of books on this, um, you can identify species, procure them and breed them if you absolutely need to, to, to increase uh, dietary breadth. What is worth raising is the fact that a very large number of amphibians are maintained in apparent clinical health, uh, good health, with just commercially available invertebrates, um, provided that they are managed appropriately in terms of, of improving the nutrition. 
So culture in pre items is not required, but it can improve things. There's a bunch of different um, non-living diets that can also be used. Um, uh, pellets and other prepared diets. These are myriad in their uh, forms, huge different, loads of different uh, suppliers and manufacturers make these things, which so I won't go um, into them. Some of these things are designed to be nutritionally complete, and at least according to their, um, their nutritional breakdowns do seem to hit the right points. Um, they have the several disadvantages, though, that they rot quickly. Um, in the environment because they are literally just a blob of uh, of ready to break down nutrients for bacteria and fungi. A lot of amphibians won't feed on them, and we're especially talking about terrestrial amphibians here. There's no movement. Um, they won't tend to eat it um, without a lot of uh, individual hand feeding and time consuming work. Um, they can be high in thiaminases or iodine, and that's because a lot of fish food is made from other fish, um, especially cheap uh, brands can be um, actually quite inappropriate. And for things like freeze-dried invertebrates, you can buy uh, fish food, which is freeze-dried gamarids or uh, bloodworms or other things. And although sometimes they can be suitable, very often they are sort of just dried husks that will not be particularly um, uh, uh, sort of attractive to the animals to eat, uh, maybe difficult to digest because of the, um, the, the fact that they've got no water content in them um, and they can also be nutritionally inappropriate. Um, so many different invertebrates are nutritionally inappropriate and just drying them can often think, make things worse. They can be there as an absolute backup though in, in times of need. Um, a variety of frozen foods are also um, available. They're really convenient because you can just pop them out the freezer, defrost a bit and drop it in. They work really well for aquatic animals especially, um, but like pellets and other prepared food, they rot extremely quickly. And that can be particularly dangerous in that um, they can also introduce some pathogens that have survived the freezing process. And um, they can become nuclei, for example, for saprolegnia growth, which not only will poison the water with ammonia and nitrites, but it will also potentially infect um, aquatic amphibians with organisms that are growing on those uh, rotting food items. Um, they don't move because they're dead, that's the idea, but um, some amphibians may still not feed on them, even though they smell like the real thing. A lot of aquatic salamanders, for example, will head over to the food item and spend ages sniffing it, waiting for movement, um, but without that movement they won't eat, and sometimes it requires a little bit of learning for them to realise that this thing that smells amazing is actually food and they'll be able to eventually find it without, without movement. It needs to be stored properly not refrozen. Obviously, that you can control this yourself um, by watching your freeze and making sure that you only get out the right amount. But very often, the cold chain for these products is broken, especially if you buy from pet shops or small suppliers. It gets shipped from a supplier, someone leaves it out on the counter or it gets delayed in the van, and it's half frozen, only half frozen by the time it gets put in the freezer of the supplier. And that can really have an impact on the quality and the safeness of the food. So being confident in your supply is really important with these things. And obviously it should be thawed out before feeding out. Um, I find the best way to do this is to dip, uh, put the, uh, the cubes into a dish. It will freeze, it will defrost and release a sort of um, smelly water as well as the, the, the items which you can then pour off and avoid pouring all of that into your aquarium. Then you can um, add it to your tank. Um, it's also just from a practical point of view, easy to pour it in at the surface of an aquarium and have it just snow food everywhere, which uh, makes it really difficult to then find that the stuff that's uneaten later. So by carefully putting it uh, close down to the substrate, um, either by dropping it carefully or using a turkey baster can be really good because it allows you to feed, for example, in a, in a submerged water dish or in just one part of the aquarium so you can see if animals are eating and you could pull it out. The other advantage to non-living diets like these is they can be good for drawing animals out of hiding. Um, at uh, London Zoo, for example, we have um, uh, Noriogus caesari newts, um, the uh, emperor newts, and they live in a really complex environment of sort of limestone boulders and whatnot. And the only time you really see all the animals is when you feed them. So feeding this kind of thing, which smells nice, but doesn't disappear into the tank, uh, can be a really good way of actually getting a, a visual on, on secretive animals. Um, the idea of collecting feeders from nature came up in some of the discussion briefly. Um, this can come from a whole range of different sources, from meadow sweepings that it's sometimes termed, um, i.e. in terrestrial invertebrates, often collected in grassland or, or, or from shrubs, etc., using nets and technologies developed for entomology, um, or doing the same in aquatic um, environments to collect aquatic stuff. 
um, in some um, cases, even tadpoles and other amphibians, if they're important components of diets, can be uh, collected, or vertebrates for that matter. Um, the advantage of this is that it massively improves the variety. If you can go out, especially into the environment from which a particular species comes and collect um, its natural prey items, what could be better than that? And um, this has a knock on implication for the nutritional content of those feeder items. And I know from anecdotes and experience, seeing animals that have been fed on uh, wild collected diets tend to have better co co coloration because there's more carotenoids available and they tend to do very well um, because of that nutritional uh, breadth is there. They are obviously free apart from the time it takes to go and collect them. And it's also a good way of getting a variety of sizes. So a lot of tiny metamorph, post-metamorphic amphibians are very difficult to feed. We'll talk about that shortly. Um, but collecting stuff from the field can be one way of tackling uh, the problem of small food. There are some major problems with doing this though. Um, for one thing, some of the feeders can actually be predators. It's very easy to accidentally collect a carabid beetle or a spider or something like that and introduce it into the, uh, the enclosure and find that rather than a nice fat uh, amphibian sat there the next day, you might have a nice fat insect that's eaten everything else. Um, and there's also a big risk of diseases and parasites being introduced um, as well as other threats. So for example, um, lots of these inverts, if they've, been, if they've come from contaminated zones may have uh, traces of toxins, pesticides, herbicides, to um, industrial waste, either in their tissues or in their GI tract. Um, and another really important thing is that although it doesn't cost very much in terms of money, um, it's very time consuming to do this, especially to scale up to uh, large captive populations, and it's really unreliable. For example, if you have a tropical amphibian and, you and you're keeping it in, in northern Europe, um, you're not going to be able to collect food for them for at least a quarter of a year uh, from outside. So in general, this is a possibility. It's more available if you're keeping animals within range, um, so you can collect what they would be feeding on in the wild. But it has so many cons that if this can be avoided, it's probably better to take other routes to providing appropriate nutrition. Um, this is all stuff which I think uh, Andrea has covered, um, so I won't go. I won't dwell on it too much. But we know that of that handful of invertebrates that are available as commercial feeders, they're usually pretty rubbish. They're sort of the fast food of the uh, of amphibian husbandry world. Um, they contain lots of protein. Uh, in many cases, they're very high in phosph uh, phosphorus, phosphates, very high in fats, but they're deficient in a whole suite of, of minerals, especially calcium, um, which leads to the fact that metabolic bone disease is perhaps one of the most common um, pathologies seen in captive amphibians, um, and a whole bunch of different vit vitamins and things like fatty acids. Uh, there was, an, again, going back to mountain chicken frogs, um, it was more than a study which collected the field the wild diet of these frogs from the wild and compare the nutritional content of this to um, the diet they have in captivity and the particular things that Amanda Ferguson will talk about this in more detail later but this highlighted that there were some really key nutritional groups that were lacking in commercially uh, raised invertebrates. Having said that if you can get commercially raised crustaceans and snails or culture there at your own these can be quite good for calcium. Um, and it's important to note that some uh, inverts are exceptionally high in fat, especially waxworms and mealworms. And this can lead to a, a problem that not only can they cause obesity in animals that are feeding on them, you can also get animals that become almost addicted to some of these things, especially waxworms. Um, and I've had numerous times situations where um, particular individual animals have gone on a hunger strike if they aren't offered waxworms. And so these things you need to be really, really careful of um, because they can absolutely take over a diet and cause havoc pretty quickly. All of this means that there are some really common nutritional deficiencies. Again, I'm not going to dwell on this because I think this has already been covered, um, but hypervitaminosis A, um, this causes a whole range of different problems with soft tissues, especially everything from short term syndrome where um, the, the squamous cells in the, in, in, the, in the oral tissues are unable to extend. Um, so smaller neurons with um, tongues that stick out their mouth are unable to actually feed and they'll starve to death. Um, it can cause issues with healing or ulceration, um, cause problems where you, you see edema and bloat 
from, from organ failure, slow growth rates, poor healing. And this is a really good candidate for if you have that failure to thrive that, um, uh, that, um, that was mentioned earlier um, by Andrea, um, where the animals are kind of alive, they don't do very well though, and they tend to sort of just peter off now. And vitamin A can be something key to look at in this situation. Um, tremors and other neurological disorders can be the results of hypervitaminosis. Uh, B, again, strongly linked to thiaminase. So you see this in animals that have been led, uh, linked, uh, that have been fed uh, diets high in thiaminosis will start to develop these tremors. It's not the only cause of that, of course. Um, carotenoids, these are yellow and red pigments, um, sorry, orange and red pigments, um, which are really key to make um, uh, coloration in, in the skin of amphibians. This is a picture from some work that Andrew was actually involved in as well at Manchester. Um, and just shows that even in species that aren't red, carotenoids are still really key. There's a, an animal at the top supplemented with carotenoids, the bottom animal wasn't. We don't really understand the health implications of these things besides coloration, but we know that it affects their reproductive fitness um, and it probably has background effects on, on, on sort of uh, fine brain health. Calcium and vitamin D um, are probably the most important thing to think about when it comes to amphibian diets simply because these cause problems more frequently than anything else and, and and can cause really quite terrible damage quite quickly especially in young growing animals calcium is a crucial component of bones um, and skeleton structure um, and also for the functioning of nerves and vitamin d3 is required for the uptake up, up uh, active uptake of calcium from the diet in the intestine can be uptaken um, passively and for species that live, for example, olms or whatever that live totally away from uh, daylight and have very slow metabolism, this is probably the more important way of doing it. Uh, but for many species, vitamin D3 is required. It can be acquired uh, either through the diet or through exposure to UVB light. And again, understanding our species biology is key um, in deciding which route to go, but it's becoming more apparent, at least anecdotally and through the small amount of literature, uh, that UVB radiation is probably important for the health of a lot of species. Um, if you don't have this um, calcium, enough calcium in the diet, or um, if there's more, if there's an inverse amount of phosphate um, in the diet, which can have the same impact, even if the calcium is there, you see um, in young animals, the calcium just isn't laid down in the bones and they will never develop proper uh, skeletal structure, structure. In older animals that have established skeletons, uh, the calcium is actually then stripped out of the bones in order to keep the nerves going and keep the blood calcium level correct. Um, and the result of this is weak, deformed skeletons with fractures, rickets, um, something often called rubber jaw that you can see in the ceratophagus here, um, a more flattened posture as the skeleton it struggles to take the weight of the animal and becomes deformed under the stresses of, of just of an animal moving. Um, and ultimately, you can see neurological symptoms as the nerves run out of calcium um, and ultimately death. Um, you can see this bottom picture here shows a relatively healthy white tree frog versus one uh, with fairly mild metabolic bone disease. And what you typically find with animals that have recovered from this by increasing supplementation of calcium D3, providing UVB radiation as appropriate, you typically see these animals suffer lifelong symptoms, not only from permanent deformities of their bones, but also a tendency to um, develop tetany when stressed and a whole bunch of other problems. So this is something which is really crucial to get right early on in the life of an amphibian. And it's something which is basically impossible to put right later on. Lots of captive amphibians are very fat. Here are two examples here. Um, generalized obesity, you see the, lip, the sort of um, fatty tissues uh, developing in all the soft tissues, and both externally and around the organs, which has all of the problems um, that are typically related to obesity in most, in most uh, organisms. Um, everything from uh, problems with uh, organs through to uh, mobility problems, which can affect reproductive success, um, through to increased risks of cancer and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it can also be laid down in particular tissues. So this, uh, this tree frog here is showing corneal lipidosis. This is where fat is actually laid down in the eye itself, which is irreversible and causes blindness. So again, this is something where 
we want to avoid getting into this position rather than try and bring animals back from it. And what you'll typically see is animals that have once been obese, especially to the level of this white tree frog here, even after they've lost the weight, they're not right. Uh, they tend to have slightly strange metabolisms. They tend to want to eat very large amounts of food, have a real tendency to put on weight quickly, um, and they can retain fat in certain uh, places in their body while losing it elsewhere. So trying to get an animal that is actually functioning like a normal animal, again, is very difficult. It's also possible to give too much of certain supplements. Vitamin A and D are particularly commonly over supplemented. Um, at one point, vitamin A was a very uh, highly supplemented uh, nutrient because it was given as part of uh, the in the animals can sometimes change this from vitamin A to carotenoids and it was often given as a color supplement and that can cause uh, problems itself but it's also worth just looking at what the content in is in your diet and vitamin d sometimes there's a tendency to try and throw as much vitamin d3 at animals as possible in order to avoid uh, deficiencies but this can cause over uh, supplementation and we know that um long term at least in reptiles and it's probably the case in amphibians too this can lead to for example calcification of major blood vessels and organs um, which can be itself catastrophic and irreparable so we have to be careful when we're preparing diets that we're not just concerned about under supplementation which is far more common but we are being careful that we're not going too far and overcompensating and giving animals too much of a good thing there are several key ways of improving the nutritional content of uh, invertebrates that we use to feed uh, uh, amphibians, because we need to be able to close those gaps between those key nutrients, um, what, how between the levels they are in wild diets and, and what you find in, in typical um, unsupplemented commercially bred invertebrates. Gut loading is probably the most famous of these. Um, so you're essentially taking, uh, you're treating a cricket or a locust as if it's an empty pill case, um, and you're feeding it on something which um, balances out those problems, stuffing that pill full of, of a nutritionally good diet and then feeding it to the animal. Um, and this is to be slightly um, differentiated from uh, maintenance diets for invertebrates, which are a very similar principle, but maintaining these animals for much longer on the gut and diet so that their actual tissues become uh, more nutritionally uh, sound. Um, um, apologies for that point, it hasn't come up at the right time. But um, again, this is very much a scattergun approach. Um, we want to try and get as much goodness into crickets um, and other invertebrates as we possibly can do. Um, but it's also important to focus on particular groups. A good place to start is a diet rich in mixed fruits and vegetables, um, especially those that are lower in sugars. Um, combined with commercial recipes and some really good ones are now available historically these used to essentially be bran dyed um different colors uh, but now some really good ones are available and we can add in specific supplements for example carotenoids and what we can generate is a diet feed to crickets that is palatable to the crickets but will also boost a range of different um, nutritional content uh, contents and it's important to look at what your unsupplemented diet has your best guess for the requirements of the animals you're feeding, especially looking at if you've experienced nutritionally related problems with that species and you want to target it, and then look at the nutritional content of the diet that you're providing, not only in its raw form, but how it affects the performance of the crickets. Um, and these can be really rewarding uh, exercises to go through in terms of actually evaluating these um, and can be quite affordable for some of the basic uh, basic nutrients and just making sure that what you're doing is actually achieving what you think it's achieving is really key as i said this doesn't work so well for all um, nutrients calcium is a good um, case in point as i said most of these insects have very low amounts of calcium in them and that's their natural state so if you try to elevate the amount of calcium in a cricket you end up poisoning the cricket and most of these um, orthopterans especially will die very quickly if you feed them lots of calcium and they also won't achieve a brilliant calcium to phosphorus ratio so even uh, gut loaded crickets on a very high calcium diet will barely um, reach the sort of two or three to one calcium to phosphorus ratio let alone the actual doses of calcium required um, 
So it's important to, and it's important to gut load invertebrates for at least 48 hours. The literature generally has come to the conclusion that at that point, um, they're saturated, their entire GI tract is packed full of food, but it is worth also watching what the invertebrates are doing. And what sometimes happens is, especially if you've bought these invertebrates from a supplier, they turn up having been dispatched to you through, you know, through the post or courier service, they're very hungry. They will often absolutely go crazy for a gut load diet for the first 24 hours. But then as they become um, sort of satiated um, and more fussy with their food, they may stop eating it. So looking at when your invertebrates are actually feeding on the diets is another really important uh, thing to consider. So 48 hours as a rule of thumb, but investigations within a particular facility in a particular context are really important. Um, it's also worth knowing that some invertebrates are better than others for gut loading. So for example, for some nutrients at least, um, um black crickets are better than brown crickets they they have a larger sort of internal capacity for holding stuff and they will eat more a wider range of foods um so if you're trying to gut load for something specific choosing the right species um and certain uh, nutrients are not so good so i did some work for example showing that offering dendrobina earthworms a calcium rich um gut load diet didn't actually do very much to improve their calcium despite the fact that they were actually feeding uh, a little bit on on the diet so again validation is important and it's also important to think about not only how long it takes to accumulate these things but how quickly they lose it as soon as you take invertebrates away from their food source the influx of nutrients stops but the outflux continues because remember you're just packing these animals uh, full of food in their GI tract rather than improving their tissue uh, nutri nutritional content. Um, so uh, these graphs show just something I did with um, crickets. Um, this is black crickets. Ignore the fact that there are the blue and the red bars. They don't really mean anything in this context. Um, and there's no significant difference anyway between the pairs. Um, but you can basically see that this each pair of bars represents a time point uh, after crickets have been um, started to be fed a, a gut loading diet which was then removed after 48 hours and this is the calcium the top graph and the bottom one is phosphorus and you can basically see that the gut loading diet didn't change the phosphorus which remained high throughout as expected and while feeding um the calcium rich diet did boost the calcium for uh, 24 and 48 hours within 24 hours of the animals being taken away from their food as would happen if you put them into an animal's enclosure they return to their baseline levels of calcium so we need to make sure that animals are eating gut loaded crickets as quickly as possible and we'll come on to some of the ways to achieve that uh, soon the other way of improving the nutrition of these invertebrates is from dusting um, them with nutritional uh, powders so these have been formulated to stick to in insects. Some, some brands stick so well that they actually clog the uh, spiracles and can kill insects pretty quickly. So we need to consider that. Um, but most brands don't do that. They're particularly good for uh, delivering calcium and some other uh, associated vitamins and minerals that are either difficult to concentrate in food items or will um, be rapidly broken down by insects when they're eaten or would kill the insect. So that's why calcium is a particularly good one here because a cricket that is dusted will live a lot longer than a cricket that is um, gut loaded with high amounts of calcium. But again, the nutritional content declines over time. Um, these graphs you can see at the bottom right are uh, the calcium and calcium to phosphorus ratio of crickets dusted with a variety of different brands um, of uh, of calcium um, over uh, six hours after dusting and you can see right at the zero line um, you've got close to the zero line you've got control undusted crickets and you can see that while um, they were the crickets were always better in terms of calcium content after six hours than the controls we did get um, a threefold approximately drop in calcium content over just six hours if you extend that over 24 hours it's even more uh, that the crickets lose because it falls off, it clumps due to humidity in the environment, and the crickets will clean themselves um, because they don't like being covered in dust. So again, um, it's really important to make sure that amphibians are eating animals at the point of supplementation and not sometime after.
these uh, products are also really sensitive to how you store them. They should be stored cold, but not frozen. Um, and they need to be stored away from high humidity um, and um, sunlight, because otherwise, although some of the minerals won't break down, so for example, calcium, a lot of the trace vitamins that are in these uh, products may do. Um, and you'd also be aware of what the use by date and these things is, because they will go off over time. So uh, presenting food, as I said before, um, all amphibians, pretty much, at least terrestrial ones, are mainly dependent on movement, hence the T-Rex, uh, to see their prey. Um, and we need to make sure that we're bearing that in mind because a lot of um, amphibians just won't eat dead prey. There's ways of getting around that, which I've talked about briefly and I'll come to shortly. But we also need to, as I said, make sure that food is consumed as quickly as possible. This is partly, as I've said, to make sure that the nutrition is as close to the, the optimum um, that you've achieved through gut loading and dusting, um, but it's also to reduce the risk of later harm to amphibians in the enclosure. Um, adding too much food can lose to, which isn't eaten straight away, can lead to pollution if that food rots. That can happen in a terrestrial or aquatic environment. Um, and it can also lead to potential stress and predation to the amphibians themselves. For example, if you add a cricket, a small cricket to a, a complicated enclosure and it's not fed on straight away, in two to three weeks, that cricket may survive and become a large adult cricket, which is pot, which is capable and very capable of feeding on small amphibians. And the, the hunter, the hunted may become the hunter. Um, it's also important that a lot of, um, especially anurans, have a uh, the way their brains work and the way that their predatory re reflexes are triggered means that they only have a certain number of um, sort of strikes in them before they have to recharge um, that ability to strike. And the constant pressure, that sort of presence of prey items can almost habituate to them and stop generating a food reflex. So it's much better if you can feed small, um, feed infrequently, so there are gaps between uh, feeding so that when prey items go into an enclosure, it stimulates a really strong pre, uh, feeding reflex. And in order to do this, we need to think about the activity patterns of, uh, of amphibians. Amongst different species, there are nocturnal, diurnal, crepuscular, and species that kind of are, are more active around the clock. And thinking about when animals uh, feed is really important to present it correctly. Um, again, in mountain chickens, I've done some work looking at their behavior where at night, which shows that not only are these things nocturnal in their uh, activity and when they feed especially, but this is phased throughout the night. And mountain chickens, for example, will do certain behaviors, for example, feeding immediately after the lights turn off, they'll come out and feed, and other behaviors, for example, bathing much later in the night. So knowing more about your animals by observing them can tell you when the best way is to feed these things. Um, and other environmental cues as well as light can be important. Temperature, spraying, anyone that's done field herping will know that the conditions have to be perfect to go out and see large numbers of foraging uh, amphibians. So trying to replicate those things in captivity can be great. So for example, spraying an enclosure before the lights turn off, just before the lights turn off can mean that the animals are ready to come out to feed. Um, and being aware that lots of amphibians will become dormant at certain temperatures, either high or low, um, and that will affect when they actually want to feed. Lots of species have got different methods of feeding, um, strategies, um, whether that's feeding on the substrate, in the water column, um, whether they will only feed on land, even though they may sometimes go in the water, whether they will only feed on things that go up into the branches for an arboreal species. All of these are crucial in selecting your prey items and presenting them properly. Um, some work I did in Xenopus longipes, the Lake Oku clawed frog, uh, showed that these things are capable of tailoring their follow foraging strategy based on the, pre the prey cues that are available. So if you feed these things bloodworms, uh, which is a, a, a benthic, food item, they will mainly target their feeding options, their feeding behavior to the, the, the substrate. Whereas if you feed them glassworm, calvorous larvae, which are mainly uh, planktonic animals, um, the frogs will move up into the water column and they base this just on scent alone. So we can also select foods to in, instigate 
a range of feeding responses in animals, which especially if things have got to learn to go back to the wild, getting that range of, of, of feeding strategies uh, in those animals can be important. Food sizes are absolutely crucial because if food items are too small, they may not be recognized as prey or they may not provide adequate nutrition. And if they're too large, they may cause injury uh, to animals that try to consume them, um, either through biting them or through being too large, or they may actually act as predators, or they may just, from a totally neutral point of view, um, do nothing to the animal, to the amphibian, but may just be too large to, to, to feed on. As a very rough, um, guide you can look at the distance between the eyes of of an amphibian if they have them um and for something like a cricket or a locust where it's a relatively uh round shaped animal um, the length of that insect should be a roughly the distance between the eyes of an animal if you're talking about something like an earthworm the, the sort of the, the 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 diameter of that long thin prey item should be the distance between as an absolute maximum again really key to look up the species in question though and this is only a guide and things like specialist species that feed on ants are going to be much smaller prey items um and just try to make sure that that movement is available you can for some species um train them to feed by terrestrial species to feed on either from forceps or from scent alone from from non-moving prey items um uh, but that can be very time consuming to do so it's better to look at just things that move um aquatics can feed more readily by scent alone um and um but movement is often useful and one way especially for aquatic ones to get them to feed on, on on dead items is to mix live and dead items together for example live and frozen blood well so that they get to the the, the, the live um the live moves the live provides some movement and they will then associate the smell of pellets or frozen items with that movement and eventually you can remove the moving element and they will still be able to find it because they'll know that that scent means food um feeding earthworms uh, this, these are a particularly important food item for salamanders um on land can be more challenging than it sounds if you chuck a load into an enclosure they will often disappear into the substrate where they may not be found even if you keep your animals on paper towels they will then end up going under the paper towels and the animals may charge uh, may struggle to find them um so one thing you can do is to chop earthworms up uh, for smaller uh, either for smaller animals or just for species where you don't want the, piece, the, the food item to escape um, and you can either um offer those just in front of the animals. You can put them on a, a wet piece of paper towel or a dish or just onto the substrate overnight and the animals will find them. Or you can offer by pan feeding animals with forceps or using, for example, a toothpick to impale a tiny piece of, of earthworm and, and, and wiggle it in front of an animal uh, to make sure. And for a lot of species, this can be a really good way to maintain good body condition on animals that would otherwise struggle to hunt or would require so many prey items to be added to an enclosure. It would be difficult to manage that appropriately. Um, it's for smaller terrestrial animals, especially small chordates, um, aquatic earthworms can be the only source of live food that are suitable for these things to eat, uh, which can be readily achieved, uh, available at least. And by putting those on a wet piece of paper towel in a terrestrial enclosure, you can make them available to these to these species. If you've got dead food, um, and or if you want to sort of target feed particular animals, forceps can be invaluable. Um, and using forceps or similar equipment can allow you to make sure that particular individuals are getting food. Typically, within an enclosure containing multiple animals, you will get more dominant animals. These are typically those on the bold end of the bold shy uh, personality axis um, and they will often hoover up the food and you will end up with one very fat animal and a series of animals that fail to thrive separating these can sometimes be the only way of dealing with it but by target feeding animals with forceps or similar um, you can at least try to maintain social groups that work um, this is also really crucial if you need to deliver particular medication or supplements to an individual animal um, you can use these to, to get the animals to eat. And it also is useful and it avoids uneaten food rotting. Sometimes you have animals living in very complicated environments uh, where retrieving uneaten food can be difficult. And by um, individually target feeding animals, you can avoid uh, this being a problem. In terms of how much and how often 
Um, this is totally specific to individual species, and you have everything from animals that need to feed daily, like some small dart frog or juvenile toads, for example, all the way through to things like the ulm that may last a decade without being fed. So this is based on the species, and it's important to look at uh, the size of the food they eat, the, the metabolic activity of that particular species, and to start with a kind of estimate based on the literature, based on observations, based on anecdote from colleagues, and then monitor body condition, growth, weight, and health, and adjust accordingly, either increasing or reducing food. And again, it may be better to feed little and often rather than the occasional huge meal um, for some species. Lots of amphibians are absolutely tiny, like this, this lysotriton on a little finger in the picture at the bottom right. Um, and it's sometimes really problematic to find enough food that these things can actually eat. The smallest types of food that are typically commercially available in decent, reliable numbers are hatchling crickets. And these are tiny, but they're not small enough. And they would be, for a newt like this, they would offer an active, an active predation risk. Um, so making sure that you're able to feed tiny amphibians before you bring them in or reproduce animals is really, really key. Um, one way of doing this is to collect microfoods from nature. As we said, this can work well, but it does have a lot of problems with it, especially if you're trying to keep animals in biosecure conditions. There are specific microfoods, foods that can be cultured, things like um, microscopic aquatic foods, um, springtails, um, aphids, um, and but sometimes none of these things work, and it's impossible to get things small enough. Um, and one solution to this is to create a highly complex natural tank seed it with um, small food items like uh, springtails and let them reproduce so that there are baby springtails and then introduce animals. And sometimes this is the only way to get small amphibians uh, to get to that threshold where they can start taking commercially available prey. So what if animals aren't feeding? One of the um, key one, sort of despite having the best plans for exactly what you want to feed the animals, how much, how often, how you're going to gut load and supplement uh, the things, sometimes amphibians just refuse to, um, to feed. And usually inappetence is a result of something being wrong, unless it's the animals not eating because it's supposed to not eat, for example, dormant animal in the middle of winter. Um, so it's worth working through these kinds of ideas to try and work out what's wrong in order to get the animals to feed again. Ideally, you'd change one thing at a time so you knew what was wrong, but sometimes you can change multiple things if time is of the essence. In any case, likely when you make the change, there will be a delay as the animal uh, returns to a normal stress state and is able to start feeding again. So look at things like basic things like husbandry parameters and social interactions of animals within the enclosure. Look at the food items you're using and the sizes. Um, not only um, do individual amphibians have, um, well, individual species have particular requirements, but individual animals um, can have preferences. This can be based on their personality. It can be based on the way that we're raised. So for example, juvenile fire salamanders that are raised on crickets have a lifelong preference for eating crickets, whereas those fed on earthworms as juveniles have a lifelong preference for feeding on earthworms. Um, so if you've particularly got new animals um, that have come from another facility, learning what they were raised on can be a good way to get them to feed. Or you can use high value prey items. I mentioned waxworms as essentially kind of the burrito of the amphibian world. They're not very good for the animals because they're very high in fat, but they will often get animals to feed um, and they can put weight on an animal that is becoming uh, close to uh, starved. starved. Um, making sure the enclosure is set up physically correctly is really imp important. Does the animal have suitable hiding places to feel uh, secure enough to feed is a good important is a good thing to look at. And are the furnishings allowing the invertebrates to escape or not come in contact with amphibians? Think about those cues that I mentioned in terms of what gets animals into foraging modes. Look at the correct temperature, look at spraying before feeding with the important uh, caveat that if you 
add dusted crickets into a wet enclosure, they will lose almost all of their supplementation straight away. So it's important to spray the enclosure and add the crickets uh, to a dry place, or at least not spray it after you've added the invertebrates. Look at the photo period. Are you feeding the animals at the right time? Is it too bright? Is it not bright enough? Lots of uh, um, animals that feed at night are actually feeding crepuscularly when there's low light levels. Um, and it's possible for it to be too dark for an amphibian to find food. Um, so you can adjust when the animal's fed in order to make sure that it's coinciding with the, uh, the, the feeding uh, point of view. And you can, you can monitor animals now using very cheap wireless uh, security cameras, which you can pay. As long as you've got Wi-Fi, you can hook them up to a phone or a computer and you can watch the animals through infrared light after dark to see what they're doing. Change how you're presenting the food. Um, do you need to, if you're a tongue feeding animal, do you need to wiggle it more differently? You can, for example, try touching its, its face with the food. You can touch the front limbs or to try and generate a feeding response. And the very last um, thing you may need to consider force feeding or assist feeding an animal, opening its mouth and putting food into it. And sometimes for an animal that hasn't fed for a very long time, this can kickstart the metabolism and get them eating again. Patience is the key though. Um, lots of amphibians take a long time to settle into new environments or to recover from things that were stressing them and being persistent, not changing things too quickly and allowing the animals time to adjust to what you're doing is important. It's also important to make sure that an animal that has lost a lot of condition has begun to catabolize its muscles, etc., is not fed too quickly. It's possible to shock the animal by providing it with so much nutrients at such a, after such a period of, 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 of privation that they can actually go into metabolic uh, shock and, and die if you feed them too much. So a very starved animal, you should feed it small and often and build up. This is just um, a sort of step-by-step -step thing showing how you might go about uh, force feeding uh, or, or assist feeding uh, an animal. The most difficult thing with this is the restraint and the opening of the mouth. It's very, very easy to cause a lot more damage than uh, than help than, than it is to help the animal by doing this. So choosing the right items, working with vets to make sure that you're opening the mouth correctly and getting food in and then making the animal actually swallow it. A lot of the times if you put food in and, and you're in an amphibian that doesn't want to feed its mouth, it will simply just spit it back out. Um, so this needs to be really considered as a last, uh, a last, um, last, sort of a line, last line of defense. Um, general disturbance can also be a really key um, thing that can influence amphibians feeding. Um, lots of times when we have especially very important conservation populations of amphibians, we want to check that they're okay. And the easiest way to do that is to go into the enclosure, lift everything up and, and make sure they're fine, catch the animals frequently to take veterinary samples, to weigh them, to get an eye on them. But sometimes this can be the absolute worst thing to do. Um, there's two examples of this I can give from work I've been involved in. One is some published work with Sicilians, where we showed that, so Sicilians live in a enclosure full of soil, basically terrestrial ones, and they make burrow structures. And eventually you have to dig, if you want to check these animals, you have to dig them up, break down their burrow structures, find them, go, yeah, they're fine, or they're not fine, and then put them back in and they start afresh. And what we showed was that over a series of, 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 of uh, intervals of digging these animals up approximately every six to 12 months, we showed that after they had been dug up, their feed intake substantially reduced for weeks after they had been, had been dug up. Um, and similarly for mountain chicken frogs, this is work that's in press at the moment, film these frogs at night for about a month either side of a disturbance event where frogs were caught up for an annual health check. And what we showed was that hunting behavior as well as a whole bunch of other social and other behaviors were strongly perturbed for up to a month after uh, the animals had been caught up. So these animals almost stopped feeding. Um, they, they massively reduced their social interactions and reproductive behavior. They changed their activity patterns, all the result of being caught up for an important health check. And what was even more important about this was that um, when we made these, when we did these catch ups, not all of the animals were caught up and even animals that were in neighboring pens where the individuals themselves weren't disturbed, but the pens next door, there was lots of crashing and bashing and, um, and, and, and turning over of a refuter, et cetera. Even these animals were affected to a lesser degree, but they were affected. So thinking about how you're managing animals and avoiding the sort of 
death spiral where the animal's not doing well so you check it more often which causes more stress which causes it not to feed um so you have to check it more often because it's getting worse and you end up starting stressing the animal to death where it, it never gets a chance to recover is really important and this can be a really important conversation to have with veterinary staff who want to get for a good reason eyes on animals and finding that balance between checking the animals and making sure that we meet those needs legislatively and ethically but also give the animals time to recover between disturbance is really really crucial um so just to sort of wrap up um, I know that I've touched on a whole range of different points here, some more practical, some more theoretical, um, and any one of those could form probably the, the topic of an entire talk. So it's been a, a fairly whistle-stop tour through it. But again, just to think about these key points to bear in mind when you're uh, designing and managing the diets for captive amphibians is to vary the diet as much as possible and base it on the wild diet as much as possible. And when I talk about variation, I don't mean just in what they're eating in terms of species, but also the nutritional composition of those species. It's really important to get as much variety as possible, to make sure that you source it safely and appropriately, um, to make sure that it's a su supplemented properly, both through gut loading and through um, uh, dusting, as well as through um, appropriate selection of species. Uh, to make sure that what you've chosen is suitable for this species and the individuals in question. And you can do this by looking at what ought to be right, looking at the literature through the literature, through looking at the species biology, but also by observing your individuals in question um, and make sure that you've presented it in the right way. And crucially to keep evaluating, are the animals doing well? If they're not, is there a nutritional aspect? If they are doing well, um, is there still any way we can further improve it and to share these results? Any published, well-documented um, nutritional success or failure is really, really important so that we can develop this field. Because as I said, we know almost nothing about it um, and any knowledge is highly useful. So thanks very much for your attention and I think we've hopefully got some time for questions.